Hashem. In our discussion tonight, we will examine the way the Prophet ﷺ interacted with his first two grandsons, the birth of Imam al Hassan and the birth of Imam al Hussein. According to most traditions, Imam al Hassan was born on the 15th of the month of Ramadan, year three of the Hijrah. So three years after the Prophet um, settled in Medina, Imam al Hassan السلام, was born. There are some other figures that you will see, maybe year four, but the most common cited, commonly cited figure is year three. Now this was a very important event in the life of the Prophet because this is now his first grandson being born and so the Prophet was very excited for the birth of Imam al Hassan. The Prophet asked for him to be wrapped in a white piece of cloth and the Prophet took him, he kissed him, the Prophet put his tongue in the mouth of Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hassan started to suck the tongue of the Prophet, then the Prophet did the Adhan in his right ear and the Iqama in his left ear and the Prophet had his head shaved which is mustahab to shave the head of the newborn and then you basically weigh the hair, few grams, whatever the weight of the hair is you give in its weight an amount of charity in silver and that's what the Prophet did. So let's say, let's say it's 10 grams, 20 grams, the Prophet gave 20 grams of silver to the poor and then the Prophet had the head of Imam al Hassan ointed with a type of fragrant ointing called khaluq in Arabic, it's basically a type of perfume. Then the Prophet said to Asma, O oh Asma, the Jahiliyyah before Islam, they would basically um, get some blood and that's how they would oint the head of the child. The Prophet said no, in my sunnah this is rejected, we use this type of perfume but not blood that the uh, Jahiliyyah would do. Then the Prophet approaches Imam Ali السلام, and he tells him, oh Ali have you named your son? He told him, Ya Rasulullah, I'm not going to name him before you name him. This, this is the honor that we want for you to do. The Prophet said, no, and I'm not going to name him before Allah names him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet, Ali is unto you like Harun was unto Musa. That's the relationship between you. فَسَمِّهِ بِسْمِ ابن Harun." give him the name of the son of Harun. The Prophet says, what was the name of the son of Harun? <coughs> Jibra'il told him Shubbar, he told him Lisani Arabi, what does that translate into Arabic? Because I want to give my son an Arabic name, he says in Arabic Shubbar translates to Hassan, so if you take the Hebrew language of Shubbar and you translate it to Arabic, it becomes Hassan, فَسَمَّاهُ Hasan. So the name al Hasan comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by the way, according to historians, the name Hassan was a new name, not a name that others had named before the religion of Islam. Because many of the names of the Ahlul Bayt, they existed before Islam, such as Fatima. Fatima السلام, was not the first lady to be called Fatima, there were other Fatimas who were born before her such as the mother of Imam Ali السلام, and other Fawatim, the daughter of Hamza for instance. So the, first, the, 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 the name Fatima was not a new name but the word Hassan was a new name, the word Hussein was a new name, people in Jahiliyyah would not name Hassan and would not name Hussein. Yes, there were names similar to Hassan and Hussein. For, insta for, ins for instance, the name Hassan like Sa'd or Hassin like Sa'id, these were Arabic names. We do find in history some references that they would actually name that, 
Hassan and Hasin. But Hassan and Hussein is a new name that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the Prophet to give to his grandsons. So these are unique names according to the analysis of a number of historians. So we believe in our school of thought according to our hadiths that Allah is the one who named Al-Imam Al-Hassan and Hussein. Now Sunni sources have made a claim over here. Ahmad ibn Hanbal, the famous Sunni scholar in his Musnad, he claims in one hadith that Imam Ali السلام, says supposedly when Hassan was born, when Imam Al-Hassan was born, I named him which name? Harb. What does Harb mean? Fighting, war. Harban. I called him Harb. So the Prophet came, he said, show me my son, I want to see him. And what did you name him? So I said, Harb. Ya Rasulullah, I've chosen the name of war for my son. The Prophet said, Bal huwa Hassan. No, no. You know, that's not really a good name. Name him Hassan, which means good. Imam Ali in this hadith that Ahmad ibn Hanbal narrates, he says, okay, when my son Hussein was born, I called him Harb. They, they're giving this impression that Imam's obsessed about this name. So the Prophet said, show me my son, what did you name him? I said, Harb. The Prophet says, Bal huwa Hussein. No, his name should be Hussein. Then the third one was born. I also called him Harb. The Prophet said, what did you name your third son? I said Harb. He says, Bal huwa Muhsin or Muhassin. Then he says, the Prophet told me, give them the names of the three sons of Harun, Shubbar, Washabir, wa Mushbir, which translates to Hassan, Hussein, and Muhsin or Muhassin. Because there's a disagreement amongst ulama uh, as to whether it was Muhsin, the one whom Lady Fatima miscarried, or Muhassin. Some believe it's the correct pronunciation is Muhassin, not Muhsin. Any case. Let's stop at this hadith and analyze it briefly. Number one, this hadith contradicts the Sahih hadiths that state Imam Ali told the Prophet, I'm not going to name him before you name him. So automatically they contradict Sahih hadiths, so we dispel them. Number one, number, number one. Number two, this hadith is aimed at giving us the impression that Imam Ali's line of thinking and his taste in choosing names was not compatible with what? with the Prophet. Imam Ali wants a name, the Prophet says no, give him another name, which is not true. We find the biography of Imam Ali and the Prophet, they were very similar even in their uh, thought process, even in their taste, even in the things they would choose, they were very similar. Because Imam Ali grew up in the lap of the Prophet, he raised him. This hadith wants to falsely give the impression that Imam Ali was really, his personality was very different than the Prophet. Number three, what's interesting about this hadith is that it confirms the birth of who? Muhsin and the Prophet named him. This is a fabrication. Muhsin was not born during the time of the Prophet. Muhsin, Lady Fatima was pregnant when the Prophet passed away and then he was miscarried when she was attacked. This hadith, this hadith, basically is aimed at rejecting the incident of the door and to say that yeah he was born at the time of the Prophet and the Prophet actually asked Imam Ali this question and he named him. So no one, no Muslim will come and think oh Lady Fatima was pregnant and she got hurt and maybe she miscarried. See it's a way to deny that tragedy. So they claimed they couldn't deny Muhsin because clearly Lady Fatima had a son by the name of Muhsin. So they couldn't deny that, so they changed the story and made it appear that he was born during the life of the Prophet to avoid this whole incident. In any case, this hadith in Musnad Ahmad does not stand. It is contradicted by other Sahih hadiths that Imam Ali, to begin with, he asked the Prophet to name them and he did not name them Harb. And why would he name them that name? This, this name was the, uh, whose, whose name was Harb? The father of Abu Sufyan? Abu Sufyan ibn Harb, yeah? Abu Sufyan's father, at this time, year three in Medina, 
Abu Sufyan was the foremost enemy of Islam, mobilizing armies against the Prophet. And Abu Sufyan's uh, father, Sakhr ibn Harb, I don't know, either, either his father or grandfather, his name is Harb. You think Imam Ali is now going to take the name of the Prophet's enemy's father to give it to his son? When did Ali ibn Abi Talib do something like that for us to accept this? So this is preposterous, ridiculous, and we don't accept it. I guess also giving the impression that Imam Ali is giving names that are not peaceful. Exactly, names that are aggressive. You know, you, you don't name your child an aggressive name. The Ahlul Bayt would not do that. So yes, that's another observation here. His name is Harb? Sakhr ibn Harb. Sakhr ibn right. His name, Abu Sufyan's name is Sakhr, his father is Harb. So why would Imam Ali, you know, be adamant in naming his son the name of the father of his enemy, you know, that's not something the Imam Ali would do. Now, if you noticed in the hadith with the Prophet, he said to Asma, give my son. Scholars have a discussion, who is this Asma? The common understanding was that this is Asma, the wife of Ja'far, Asma bint Umais, the wife of Ja'far al-Tayyar. Now there's a historical dilemma because in year three or four of the Hijrah, where was Ja'far? He was in Abyssinia, exactly, he was in Habasha. When did he come to Medina? Year what? Year seven. He came year seven at the concurrent with the conquest of Khaybar. He came back. So the argument is Ja'far was not even present in Medina at this time. So how is it that his wife is here? So there's two explanations. We also find her name at the marriage wedding of Lady Fatima alayhi salam and we discussed that before. Briefly the first analysis is that Habasha is just across the Red Sea from the Arabian Peninsula. It would just take a few days for people to travel. So yes, they lived in Habasha but it doesn't mean that they would not visit the Prophet when they could. And there was no danger because the Najashi was just, he respected Muslims. They're not going to Mecca to face persecution. You go from Habasha to Medina to visit Rasulullah, keep up with the Muslims, what's the problem? So maybe she would visit frequently, that's completely normal. Number two, some scholars believe that later scribes who wrote the hadith, they confused her with another asma. We have Asma bint Yazid al Ansariya. She was the daughter of the one of the Ansar. And if you remember, we talked about her before in our biography class. She was the, the speaker, the female speaker. She was very eloquent. She would give speeches. And she's the one when the Prophet promised a great reward for the fighters. She came to the masjid. She said, Ya Rasulullah, we take care of the children. We keep up with the house. And they go and they become shaheeds and they get all the ajr. That's not fair. The Prophet praised her for her courage to come and ask this question and then the Prophet says the woman who does the chores in her house, raises the family, her ajr is no less than the one who fights in the battlefield. So this is Asma bint Yazid, some scholars believe this Asma there was Asma bint Yazid or maybe some other Asma and others, others have confused her. My personal analysis is that no, this is Asma the wife of Ja'far. And she, she visited, you know, it's, it's completely normal to visit. So one claim in Sunni books is that Imam Ali wanted to name his son Harb. Another claim that we have in our hadiths is that they have narrated, especially Sunni sources, that Umm al-Fadl, the wife of Abbas, who was Abbas? The uncle of the Prophet. She saw a dream that a body part of the Prophet was in her lap. She came next day, she told the Prophet, I saw a disturbing dream. I saw one of your body parts in my lap. The Prophet says, no, dreams are not as they appear. This is a good dream. This means Fatima will give birth to a boy and you will basically take care of him and you will breastfeed him. And so Umm al-Fadl, the wife of Abbas, she breastfed who? She nursed Imam al-Hassan. We have reason to believe this hadith is fabricated. Why? 
Year three of the Hijrah, where was Abbas? Mecca, he was with the Mushrikeen. He had not openly declared his Islam yet. It's at the Fatah of Mecca, the conquest of Mecca, that Al-Abbas joined Islam. So Al-Abbas was in Medina, there's no instance of him coming to, uh, he was in Mecca, there was no instance of him coming to uh, the city of, uh, of, of, Mecca, of Medina. Because remember at Badr, he was taken as a captive, the Muslims gained victory, he had come on the Mushrikeen side, he was taken as a captive, then he was sent back to Mecca. So he did not live in Medina all this time, so how did this happen? So there's something problematic about this hadith, that Umm al-Fadl would be in Medina at the time, at the time she was in Mecca. Number two, it seems these hadiths were fabricated by the Abbasis. The Abbasiyin, they come from the line of Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet. So they fabricated a lot of hadiths that praise Abbas and his family and his role in, in being part of the Ahlul Bayt. So maybe one way to give a good image of Abbas and his wife is that yeah, she was so close to the Prophet, the Prophet asked her to take care of Imam al-Hassan and she breastfed an Imam al-Hassan. That's another possibility. In any case, in our sources, we don't have any Sahih source that Umm al-Fadl, uh, she breastfed uh, Imam al-Hassan. Less than a year later, Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam was born. A number of narrations state he was born early in Sha'ban. Some say the fourth of Sha'ban, some say the fifth of Sha'ban. In any case, in the first week of Sha'ban, Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam was born, or some say three Sha'ban. Year four of the Hijrah. And the Prophet did the same thing that he did with Imam al-Hassan. You know, the basically the adhan, shaving his hair. The aqiqah, the Prophet ﷺ, according to one hadith, one sheep, according to another hadith, two sheep, he had them sacrificed for Imam al-Hassan and Imam al hussein And it's highly recommended that when there is a newborn, the aqiqah, is to be offered. The aqiqah is basically a sheep that is sacrificed on behalf of the newborn. It's mustahab to do this on the seventh day. What if this was not done on the seventh day? Can you still do it afterwards? Absolutely. A man came to Imam al-Sadiq he told him, I don't think my father did the aqiqah for me. The Imam told him, do it now, you do it. Because it serves as protection. It's a source of blessing for the newborn. And so the Prophet uh, did that. Now imagine the Prophet very beautifully carrying his grandson, doing the adhan, he was teaching Muslims, look don't say this as a child and he, what is he going to understand? Surround him with a good environment because everything the newborn hears and sees is stored in the subconscious. Don't say what is the newborn going to know, what is the adhan going to do? No, it's doing wonders in the subconscious. So be very careful with what your children hear, what they are exposed to. And this was a very practical way for the Prophet to do that. That's number one here. Number two, we see the Prophet from a psychological perspective is very sensitive with the color of the clothing around the infant. The Prophet said, I want my grandson in a white piece of cloth. When, the, when Imam al-Hassan was given to the Prophet, maybe Asma or whoever was there, wrapped him in a yellow piece of cloth. The Prophet criticized that, he said, no, I don't want you to wrap them in a yellow piece of cloth. That's not good, avoid that. Didn't I tell you that the newborn should, be, should not be wrapped in the color yellow? Now at the time, maybe people didn't have the capacity to do research, but modern psychology has actually confirmed that babies cry more in bright yellow rooms. When you take infants to a room that's bright yellow, they cry more. And the tempers are more likely to flare around the color yellow. So every color has its effect, this is the effect of the color uh, yellow. And I'll share with you an interesting uh, quote by the famous uh, designer Carlton Wagner in 1989. Carlton said, babies cry more and temperamental people explode most quickly in yellow rooms. 
So this is a person who has experience with design, has confirmed that the color yellow has some sort of effect. So when the Prophet said don't have them wrapped in yellow, subhanAllah, the Prophet was protecting the baby because maybe this makes the infant uncomfortable. So we see that the Prophet ﷺ pays special attention to these fine points and he's teaching Muslims, you know, especially in the Arabian society when infants didn't really have rights, you know, they were just like dolls, you know, no rights, no respect for them, nothing. The Prophet was saying, no, you have to give the infant its right. When Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hussein were born, and now the Prophet has two grandsons, he thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by adding the nawafil. Originally, how many rak'ahs were the salah? According to Sahih hadiths in our sources and in Sunni sources. Originally, when the Prophet was given the salah by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he came to give it to the people, how many rak'ahs were they? Yes. 10. Each salah was just two rak'ahs. The Prophet added how many? Seven. The Prophet added seven rak'ahs by Allah's permission, Allah approved of it and this became part of the wajib salah. So the 17 rak'ahs originally was 10, the Prophet asked Allah to make them seven more in honor of Imam Hassan and Hussein. So the hadith states, فَلَمَّا وُلِدَ الْحَسَنُ وَالْحُسَيْنِ زَادَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَعَلَيْهِ سَبْعَ رَكَعَتْ شُكْرًا لِلَّهِ To thank Allah, the Prophet asked Allah to add these seven. So anytime you pray these extra raka'at, remember that this was the Prophet's way of thanking Allah for the gift of Hassan and Hussein. And so they have a great, great honor. Also we have the nawafil by the way. Uh, there's a hadith by Ibn Shahr Ashub. He says that the arba raka'at of Nafilat al Maghrib the Prophet assigned them at the time of the birth of Imam Hassan and Hussein. The first two rak'ahs when Imam Hassan was born, the second two rak'ahs when Imam Hussein was born, the Prophet asked Allah to make this the nafila of the Maghrib, which is the right recommended salah that we do after Salat al Maghrib. Yes. So you said, I seem to recall, I might be wrong, that for Maghrib one rak'ah was added in honor of Sayyidah Fatima. Right? Yes, that's the rak'ah of the Maghrib when Lady Fatima alayhi salam was born. Uh, the Prophet asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to add later on another rak'ah, yes. We discussed that at the birth of Lady Fatima, yes we do have a hadith about that. So the, the rak'ah of the Maghrib particularly has to do with Lady Fatima, but all together these seven combined is Imam Hassan and Hussein in their honor. But specifically the Maghrib is when the Prophet was given the news that he will be granted uh, Lady Fatima alayhi salam. Also, Not the Lady Fatima, no, that's strictly in our sources. As for Imam al Hassan and Hussein, uh, this is from Imam al Baqir. So, Sunnis probably would not recognize this. This is something through our uh, Ahl al Bayt that we have received. But do they, rec do they ever say that there was only 10 at one point? Yes, definitely. In the hadith of Mi'raj, uh, in Bukhari and others, it does say that the salah was 50. Then Allah reduced it to basically five, and then the raka'at were 10, then they became 17. And that's why when you doubt your salah, if your doubt is in the original two, the salah is batil. Whenever you have a doubt, am I my first or second? The hadith states because this is the origin, original prayer, it's invalid. But if you have a doubt about the third and the fourth raka'at, because they are extra, the Prophet added them, there's a way to fix them. But they don't have anything as far as I've seen that this is this was in honor of Imam Hassan and Hussein. This is something told to us by Imam al Baqir. But do they have a time, like when, when they were added? I don't know. They, they've mentioned this in the hadith of Mi'raj. So probably they will say this was towards the end of uh, the Prophet's era in Mecca, possibly. Maybe that's their timeline. We do have. Uh, Hadith, Sunni hadith sources in Sunan Tirmidhi narrated by Ibn Abbas that the Prophet would ask Allah to protect Hassan and Hussein by making the following prayer. I basically submit you to the protection of Allah 
من كل شر شيطان from the evil of every demon or devil and the dangers of animals or people who have jealousy and the evil eye they want to strike you I am asking Allah to protect you and the Prophet would say this is how Ibrahim would ask Allah to protect Ishaq and Ismail. So this is highly recommended to do to your children. Say the same words the Prophet would say. Oh Allah, I submit my children to you, protect them from the shayateen, from the evil ones, from the jealous ones. The Prophet would constantly do this to Imam Al-Hassan and Hussein, and he would always recite the Mu'awwadatain, which are Surah Al-Falaq and Surah Al-Nas for their protection.